I didn't speak very much English until I started school. Was it difficult to understand school? Ah, uh, no. When I was young, and I mean, I, I wasn't totally mm -hmm. not English speaking, but uh, it just wasn't important. And then, of course, when, at five years old, you learn very, very quickly. So, no, I managed to retain most of it. What's your role in that? Zhivoyinovich. Oh. Which part are you from? Uh, my Sorry. father's from Shabbats. Oh, yeah. And my mother's from Zrenin. Hmm. That's neat to go down. Yeah, very close. Mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of opposite, I think, from each other in different directions. Mm -hmm. But, um... You've been there? Yeah, I was there in 1965 or 66. But, uh, the name that I use, mm -hmm. uh, on stage, it's just an Eng English translation, really. Sure, sure. So it's quite simple, and it's a lot easier to spell and say. There's yeah, a yeah. tennis player now, uh, Slobodan. Yeah. Big you know, Bobo. Bobo. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's funny because when I was a young, I mean, I heard my name mispronounced every time. And uh, watching him play tennis and hearing him get his name mispronounced was uh, pretty funny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, you know about Karl Molden. Yeah, Stefanovic. I think no, Mladenovic. Right. Uh, that's right. Well, he made a film in Yugoslavia a few years ago. But, uh, do you know about him? That in every film he has to put a uh, Yugoslav surname. When he's calling somebody, he has to put one Does in yeah. every movie. Yeah. This is his trademark. Karl Molden. He's very... Uh, how would you put it? He's very much uh, very proud of his background. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's quite, um, from what I understand, anyways, he's quite involved in like, church things mm -hmm. and community Yugoslav so. community yeah. uh, things and you know, all the charities and all the stuff to do with uh, Yugoslavia. Do you do that to yourself, or do you mm. pursue just a no. rock and roll lifestyle, whatever that is? <laughs> yeah, well, I probably have a couple of different lifestyles, mm -hmm. but. Uh, uh, not so much like that. Not not as involved as he is mm -hmm. in something like that. Um, I would. I'd love to play in Yugoslavia. We've never been to that part of Europe before. Yeah. It'd be a great opportunity to see things. My Italian paper asked me why you never played to Italy. No one asked us. <laughs> Maybe if there was interest for us to play there, then uh, perhaps we would. To say there is an incredible interest for you to play that. Oh really? Mm. And we should uh, relate to your manager. Yeah, uh, we're gonna we're planning on coming to Europe in April, and uh, perhaps we'll look at doing some different places. Um, I'd love to play in Yugoslavia, in Italy, maybe even behind the cur uh, curtain. I know it's a little easier now to play gigs there. Uh, and see, in the past there hasn't been a, like a very big interest in bringing us there, and it's expensive to tour. So for us to to uh, Go into a very small hall doesn't make sense. Mm. A big show, have to scale it down. We'd we just rather not do it. Mm. Okay, we finished with you, so I'm gonna carry on. Picking up the point that you were mentioning, or rather that uh, he mentioned, um, Rush never seems to me to be the archetype of the rock and roll band. You, you've never um, came across as being that yeah. to me. Um, am I right? Yeah, I think um, just the fact that we've been together f from the start for 19 years and touring together for 13 years, like with this lineup, we must have done something different and right because there just, there just aren't any bands that last that long, very, very few anyways. Um, it's always been important, because we're also close friends, to retain a, a family feel to the way we approached our organization, our music, our business, everything. We're very good friends with the crew. A lot of guys in our crew have been there for seven, eight, some guys 13 years. Um, management, we've been with them from the beginning, 19 years almost. Everyone's um, in the pension scheme. Yeah, that's right. They don't want to quit. <laughs> <laughs> so we've, we've had this very family-orientated outlook on, on working together. And we've also been fortunate in that we've had commercial success doing things the way we want to do them. Um, when you have that, then the record company doesn't want to do things differently, your management doesn't want to do things differently. Something's right. 
So you're allowed the freedom to continue that way. And if you can do things the way you want to do them, there's no point in stopping. Having, having not been, obviously, with you uh, touring and stuff like that, um, the other thing is I've, I've never really heard any um, any gossip about or, or scam about Rush. I mean, you know, uh, yeah. have, did you actually misbehave? Have I misbehaved? Yeah, we're, we're, we're not like a, a group of priests going on the rocks, you know. We've, we've had our good times, and we, we like to party and, and go crazy, but th that's never been what's important to this band. What's been important to this band has been the music, and the way we present our music, and the way we, uh, we make our music. Mm. So, we're coming from a different space. It's a different lifestyle for us. We work very, very hard on the road. We tour a lot. Uh, we look at it as a career, whereas for some some other bands, and I'm not saying that when we, when we were younger it wasn't like that. You know, we were excited about it. We wanted to have a good time, but a lot of times, for a lot of groups, they, they it's a it's a lifestyle and it's an ideal. It's to go out, sex, drugs, rock and roll is is the ultimate. Have a good time for five years and then it's over. But for us, we've always been musicians before. Being a particular rock band, I can confirm that uh, the attitude, uh, really, because um, as I was telling a uh, colleague here the last time, I actually did speak to you before, but you wouldn't remember it. It's, um, I think, we we're all teenagers then. It's about eight years ago. Um, oh really? We did an interview a long, long, long time ago. Not just saying it was a whole band uh, in a hotel somewhere. I just can't remember. But. Um, um, but it's a little strange. I, I don't think anything's strange in your attitude, yeah. really. So, you know, you were that you were like that eight years ago. Um, yeah, I think we've always been like that. Mm. Yeah, we, tr I mean, we try to make the most fun and everything out of it. We, we love what we do. You, you do enjoy it. But oh yeah, yeah. We, we really enjoy making records. This record, this last one especially, "Hold Your Fire," was the most fun we've ever had recording. Did I tell you this morning? Right. That's what I told you this morning. I mean, just reading the, um, the little um, piece Bio, that, that yeah, Neil yeah. Yeah. wrote. Yeah, it seems like you had bags of fun traveling. Um, yeah, we did. Riding by the lake. Um, the other uh, thing was, uh, we were so well organized, and we ran everything so efficiently. I think he might mention it in it too. We finished early, and we never ever finished early. We always finished late, go over. But this took less time with two more songs to record than, than the last record, which we thought was fun to make. So it's still um, a labor of love for us. And we still enjoy touring so long as it's not uh, too crazy, as it has been at times in the past. We prefer to work a little less than we used to and spend a little more time at home with our families. The last part of the work that you've done was uh, in trying to break into the States primarily. Um, but it seems like you, you conceived that in a, in a very short period of time. Or at least it seems to me yeah. that, that it was. Maybe it was really hard work, I don't know. Yeah, it was very hard. But, um, so I suppose having done that, having achieved that, which, which is like a security for you really, um, uh, you just, for the rest of, of, of your career, you, you try and enjoy it as comfortably as possible. Mm, that's not quite right. I, th I think it's easy to enjoy it and be comfortable as possible, but it's dangerous at the same time that you get too comfortable and then you don't take chances. You don't want to try something new for fear that it's not going to do well and that you're not going to have this Mercedes or whatever, you know, next week. Um, I think with our records, we try things and sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it works. Uh, an album like Signals, for instance, Moving Pictures was one of our biggest records. We sold a lot of three million or something, and that's a lot of records to sell. Signals was a very difficult record. It didn't sell quite as well. It didn't sell nearly as well as that, but still it did very well. But on it, we tried things that I listen to now and I know weren't right, but we learned from it. We learned that there were aspects about that record that um, we have to change and then with moving uh, with um, grace under pressure it was totally the opposite from signals 
and it was another experiment in a different direction. So we're constantly trying new things and experimenting with new things. If they if they sell well, you know, great. If they don't, so what? At least we're trying something different. We're trying to be different. We're trying to push ourselves, challenge ourselves musically. For me, this album, Hold Your Fire, is the best parts of all those records for the last three or four albums. And it, I hear elements of all those records in this record. And it's satisfying because I think I can look at it and say, well, good. We learned the best lessons from those experiments and we put them on this record. Maybe next year I won't think that. Maybe next year I'll think this record's not very good, which I hope I do. Because then you know you're going to try something even better the next time. But this has always been our attitude. And, um, and you know, I mean, it, sure, our lifestyle has become more comfortable. But when it comes to our music, we're very, very demanding on each other as well as ourselves. I only called it uh, in all these places from, uh, I don't know, sorry to uh -huh. Paris and Montserrat and so on. And on the other hand, having your first album on your own label, most probably out of desperation. Yes, exactly. I presume so. Uh, how, do, how do you look upon that big gap between, you know, I mean, all those 13 years? But uh, did you get used to this new lifestyle when, you know, you can jet around and make the album everywhere? Um, well, the, the first album uh, was recorded in, in, I think, about five days, six days total time for the whole record. It was remixed completely. Two songs were dropped and two other songs recorded, all within this five-day, six-day period. Uh, we were on a very tight budget, but it was very, very exciting. Um, Unfortunately, nobody wanted the band. All the record companies in Canada at the time said, Rush will never amount to anything. They're not the kind of band that's going to sell records and be around very long. Um, so if we wanted to release a record, the only way we could do it was to pay for the studio time ourselves, start our own record label, and, and sell it that way. We'd distribute it through a major distributor, but have it on our own label if no one else wanted us. And it, it started off okay. Locally, yeah, just right here, please. It started off well locally, but it wasn't re really going to go anywhere. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, Don't worry about us. I just want you watching. A friend, uh, a friend of ours, who worked for a major label. But he was just like a problem man. He took one of the albums and sent it down to a radio station in Cleveland, Ohio. They they started playing it as an import, and they got amazing phone response. Everybody wanted to know who it was, where can they get the record. They wanted to start importing records. The the uh, program director called somebody at Mercury Records, Cliff Bernstein, and said, "Listen, I think you should check this record out because I'm getting great response. You might want to sign this band. As far as I know." They're unheard of, no one's heard of them. So he heard it, said yes, called the next day, and, and we basically had a deal the next day. Um, and then. So, so the money you spent was what invested it? It was uh, over the long term, it was. It, it you know came about a year later that the payoff was there, and it was never intended to be a calling card to America. We wanted to release a record because we felt it was time for us to make a record locally. Um, but then, you know, we had this big American record deal, and it was very exciting. Then a six-year period started of very, very hard work, of touring, of being deeply, deeply in debt, and selling a respectable number of records, but not an enormous amount. So the whole lifestyle came much later in you know, our career, yeah. and, and, and quite gradually. So, so when did you start living next <laughs> Living comfortably, when, when was that? What, what period would you say that was? Living comfortably, probably around 81, around then, around the time of uh, moving pictures. Not to say that, well, there, were, there was a bad period around 70, uh, 75, 75, 76. It was very difficult. No money and, um, you know, living in a small apartment just barely paying rent and all that stuff. At the time, you don't think it's a big deal, though. That's just the way it is. Did you ever do any odd jobs, too? 
Yeah, yeah. My, I, wor I worked. I did some plumbing and what? not in not in, in the last uh, while, but in the earlier years of Rush. Yeah, uh, that's what worked, up. Yeah. yeah, I worked in a gas station. Played on the weekends, but through the week I, I pumped gas, and um, I also did some plumbing. My father had a plumbing business, and I worked with him sometimes to make a few bucks. Uh -huh. But um, you never look at those times as being hard times. You look at them as being the times. That that's just the way it is, and uh, it's no big deal. Can you fix a tap if it goes wrong? Now? I love to fix a tap when it goes wrong. <laughs> I, I love it. I was I, we built a new house recently. And I got in there and I was doing a few things and my father came over and he did the plumbing. He had to. I wasn't allowed to get another plumber in. He had to do it. So I helped him with some things and worked together. It's, it's fun to do. I love doing mechanical things anyways. Mm -hmm. Working with cars and things like that. So It's good fun. Mm -hmm. Do you have a family? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we all do. All right. Children? Yeah, I have two boys. A young? Not so young. Right. My older son is going to be 17 in, in a couple of weeks, and the younger one's 10. Right. Well, are you yeah. encouraging the father? If he Mu music. Fine. I mean, does he play music? Does he play music? I, I, what does he play? He, he's been in bands for a couple of years now. Oh, yeah, he's oh, been right. in. I mean, he's. I've only been in one band in 20 years, and he's been in about four or five already in two years. But he doesn't take it. Uh, he's not committed to music the same way. Right, I mean, when I was 15, that's when we started in Rush. And uh, right from the start, we wanted to write our own music and we wanted to play every chance we got. For him, you know, they, they went and they took promo shots, and they did their hair up and wore makeup, and you know, they all threw in some money to take their, these photos in a photo studio. But they never played a gig. They never had any intention of playing any gigs. They knew how to play five songs. But they like the image of being in a band. When, when I was younger, in our whole area, our whole community, there were maybe three groups. You know, everybody knew who they were and we knew each other. Now, they're in a school. You have maybe ten or fifteen bands for each school, and it's mostly kids who, who for their, for Christmas they got a Casio a keyboard or something like that, and you know. People have a little more money now, instruments are a little cheaper, it's easier to get, and it's just the the image of being in a group is uh, more attractive to them, rather than being in it for the music, or wanting to create music. But I, I encourage him to play. I wanted him to take classical guitar lessons for a while, Cause because he, he was interested in guitar, and because it's a, a good place to start, it's a good place to learn technique and discipline. Not that I want him to be a classical guitarist, but it's a great instrument to learn, and it's very satisfying to sit and play on your own and to be able to yeah, learn, so. play, yeah, play pieces. Can, I, can, can I ask you uh, a personal question? I, I promise not to not to write it, write it if you don't want to, you don't want me to. But um, how old are you? Alex? I'm 34. I don't mind. I'm 34. 34. So you 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 you. Uh, you got married when you were very, very, very young. I didn't get married when or, I was young. Or I you became a father, father when I was young. Very you got young. married later. Right. But, um... Are you, yeah, are, you, are, you pri are you happy that that actually happened? No, yeah. Because you, you can... I mean, he's 17 and, and, and okay, 34, but you, you are part of a, a younger generation. That's right. Because, because you entertain and you know, with kids out there. So did, I'm we're more friends. We yeah. have more of a friendly relationship than a father son. My younger son, who's ten, it's a different relationship. It's more of a, uh, a parent child relationship that we have. But my older son, we did a lot of things <laughs> together. You know, he came on the road a couple of times on some tours, traveled on the bus, he went with the crew on their bus, which is, those guys are crazy. <laughs> and he went and he had a good time and they entertained him and, you know, he's seen different things. He came to England a couple of years ago and we were mixing uh, power windows and Getty's nephew, who was the same age, came. They, they know each other, not very well, but they, they knew, they had the same friends from different areas. 
And we had to mix. Of course, we were working all day. So the two of them, they would go out, they'd you know, see sights, do things, as almost adults. And we came home, I remember, one night from a mix. And uh, they went, they got their ears pierced, they were wearing earrings. And, you know, they had a little bit of eyeliner here. Oh. Uh, hair's all done up. They stopped in a pub and had a beer. <laughs> and, you know, doing all these adult things. And, you know, I'm, I'm like, oh, well, you know, I'm your father, she doesn't do that. You know, I sort of laughed and thought, yeah, well, I would do exactly the same thing. And I, I did worse things anyways. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, you know, although when you become a parent a little older, you realize that there are some important things in life and you want to motivate your kids to, to do things, not to sit around and be bumps. You want them to use their brains. You have to be boring. Yeah, because you realize later, you go, I spent all those years doing nothing. Those great, great years when I was 17, 18 years old, when I was, you know, at my physical peak or, or I was really, really thinking about so many different things, I could have really done a lot. And it's terrible to look back on your life and, and have those uh, regrets. It, it indicates to me somehow that you, that you you had a very strict family background. Actually, I did. Not not very very. But a very close family yeah, background. Yeah, close family background. Yeah. Uh, my my father worked very very hard. He worked three jobs. I remember for years he worked at a as a stationary engineer you know, in a factory where they had the boilers. And he, and he also was doing the plumbing, and he also was driving taxi at night. We you know, had to make ends meet, and money was tight. And my mother worked two jobs, and, and that's the way they were. They were immigrants from Yugoslavia. They wanted to make a living. And coming to Canada or America in the 50s was very different than coming in the 70s or 80s. Then immigrants were looked down upon. If you didn't speak English, it was very, very hard. Uh, you had to work very hard at manual labor to, to make that's the only any kind thing, of... That's the only thing that could get from the... Exactly. Yeah. And I think this is why we work so hard. Mm. We were brought up to uh, realize that if you want to get anywhere, you're going to have to work for it. How big a family do you come from? I have two, bro uh, two, sisters. two sisters. Actually, I have two sisters and two half-brothers as well. Right. Yeah, so um, I, our, my two older brothers didn't live with us. I didn't meet them until I was much older. But uh, the, the three of us in the family and my two parents were all very, very close. And how, how old were you when you, when you actually met uh, Gideon? I was about 13 when I met Getty. Is it? He's 13 or 14. School. Yeah, in school. And uh, John, the original drummer, I knew from about 10 years old. And Neil, well, 13 years ago. So just actually about a week before my 20th birthday, 21st birthday. I mean, what does uh, the, uh, the writing works? I mean, judging by the bio, it's the other two who, who do the most of the stuff. Or Neil? Oh, no. Um, typically, a typical day of writing, we go for about seven weeks. There's a studio that we uh, use just outside of Toronto, about one hour. Get up about 10 o'clock in the morning, 10:30. Have breakfast together. Discuss what think you know what's happening in the newspaper and what we're going to do work-wise for the day. Neil stays. Now this studio is in a farm. Oh. Continues writing uh, at the house all day. He has an ashtray with cigarettes like this piled in it, and the floor is covered in paper. Um, and we continue working like this till about six o'clock every day. Then we get together, we discuss the lyrics, we discuss the music. Sometimes he gives us lyrics to, to put music to. Other times we give him a cassette of the music that we were working on and he writes to that. But that hour, hour and a half before dinner, we all get together and work on the arrangement, you know, make sure the lyrics fit correctly. Getty's got to feel that he's singing the lyrics with conviction, like he wrote them, and also that mechanically it's easy to sing. And then uh, we take a break an hour and a half for dinner, and then in the evening from 9 till midnight, 1 o'clock, we play as a band the stuff. I think it's important before going into the studio to play the songs like you would if you were playing it live. Then it has continuity and 
and flow. Otherwise, it sounds just like pieces all put together. And that's a typical day, and that goes on for about uh, six weeks or so, writing like that. We work six days a week, take one day off, go home, drive back out the next day, continue working. What about the, the lyrical side of it? The, the lyrical side of it, the contents, do you ever question? That's what we discuss in that period, oh yeah, yeah. That's why I say Getty has to feel, yeah, like he has to feel like he's written them. He has to know exactly what Neil is trying to uh, convey and understand clearly what it is. Neil's lyrics are not always very easy to understand. He may have two or three different meanings in his lyrics. I think it gets better with each record, it, 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 easier to understand, but... Yeah, because you get to know yeah. sort of better and so on. But, um, and his writing style changes. But it's e a lot easier when he's sitting right next to you and you say, what the hell does this mean? You know, and he can explain it. Um, basically, we know from reading the lyrics what's going on and the, uh, the intent of the lyrics. Um, it's just a matter of maybe getting things a little more understandable, a little more refined in that period. It's the same with the music. Neil will have um, suggestions or criticisms about a particular music part that, that Getty and I have written, and we'll work on that, changing it. It's all part of arranging. And then again, arrangement is taken one step further when we're all playing it together. And for the last week before we finish that writing period, Peter Collins, who's produced the last two records, comes over and again we go to the next level of um, arranging and, and uh, song, songwriting criticism. But we know now how Peter works and we write with that in mind. And we've known all along really what we want to try to accomplish with our music. So it's, uh, it's really just a matter of fine tuning. Does that have to be disciplined? Uh, or is it because you are? It's because we are. And it's because of so many years of doing it and, and trying to do it a better way each time. It's very expensive to waste time in a studio. It's also very um, and much of a burden on your uh, On, on just your day-to-day -day living, you know, you, you on your feeling, well, it must be. yeah, feeling stress and pressure in the studio is, is a, a very difficult thing. It slows you down. It makes your performance, I think, it hurts your performing because you're, you're you're getting too wound up and too tired. You need to be relaxed, and to be relaxed, you have to do things. I think very. Uh, Orderly. Orderly, yeah. And the more orderly we are, the more we get done. The more we get done, the more time we have to either relax or to look at things with a clearer mind. Uh, with this last record, th this is certainly the most orderly we've ever been <laughs> with this record. You know, working till this time, taking a break, working till this time, taking a break. And in the studio, we're the same way. We're in, we're up every morning at 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Whereas in the old days, we get up at five o'clock at night, have lunch at dinner time, work all night and finish at noon. And those are not productive hours to work. Um, so now we're, we're up early by 11 o'clock, the latest, and we're in the studio by 12. Well, yeah. <laughs> well we work till 12, um, one o'clock midnight, and then you relax, you have a drink till two o'clock talk or whatever, and you're, you're in bed by two or three o'clock. So it gives you a good eight hours of sleep, and I, th I think it's important to get that much. I know it's not that early, but when your hours go, you know, into one or two o'clock, then that's pretty good, I think. And take one day off, definitely a week, and every three weeks we take one week off, and it, we're happy. And we so make. How does this relate? This sort of orderly uh, system to when you actually go on the road, when all hell breaks loose, sort of thing. I mean. And they're going to be there, and all that. Obviously, all that changes. Or does it? It changes to a degree, in that the outside influences are different. Um, in a studio, you're in a studio, and you can control things a little easier. 
you can make a schedule for yourself and stick to it because you know exactly where you're going to be tomorrow and the next day and the next day. On the road, it's not always like that. One day you drive uh, 300 kilometers, 400 kilometers. Next day you drive 800 kilometers. Uh, you can't get a hotel tonight. You have to sleep on the bus. You know, there are different things. Does that happen to you? Not so much anymore. Yeah, yeah I'm sure it used to happen before, but, but I thought nowadays. But uh, a lot of times, you know, we do end up sleeping on the bus. We never seldom, well, I know that's not true, but 300 to maybe 600 kilometers around that is the average for our drives. And occasionally you have a, a one that's 800 or 900 kilometers. But you don't fly? No, uh, no we own our own bus. Right. It's It's less expensive than flying okay. and it's much more comfortable. Mm -hmm. You leave when you want to leave. You get on the bus, you turn the TV on, pour yourself a beer, have a sandwich, watch a movie, put a tape on, uh, listen to some music, read if you want, go to bed, sleep for a few hours if you like. You know, you know it's too noisy in the front, you go in the back of the bus. They have hostess. <laughs> no, but that's a good idea. <laughs> I'll ask my wife what she thinks. <laughs>